Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's pray and then we'll uh, we'll get ready. Um, Lord, we do just thank you and praise you for the opportunity to gather. And, uh, and even while um, we still have access to technology, we have the freedom to speak your name openly and boldly, God, without fear of imprisonment yet. And, and yet, Lord, we um, are so self-preserving, God, and, and so worldly and have uh, such a desire for the affirmation of men, God, that we fail to proclaim your glories and your wonders. And I ask for forgiveness for that, Lord. And I just pray over us and your people tonight that your spirit would be alive and well and that you would be our all in all god that our identity would be in you that our power and our strength would be in you lord that you would be our wisdom and you would be our our eyesight god that you would take us by the hand lord and walk us through and na to navigate all this hostile territory and just that your spirit would be what guides and directs our steps always even tonight as we talk with one another in fellowship um, Lord, that you would take a coal from your altar and touch my lips. I know that I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, but I also know the sufficiency of the covering of your son, God. And so I just, uh, pray that you would be magnified tonight and, uh, bless this time. And I thank you for every one more opportunity that we have to gather together and to be in unity and in fellowship and with whatever degree of peace that you afford us, God, I'm so grateful for that. So I pray all these things in the precious life-giving name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jamie. And for those of you who are late getting in the pool, uh, please just go to hear the watchman, men.com. Get yourself signed up to come to the conference in two weeks or Get the on-demand live stream uh, ticket, uh, which you will own forever. Don't miss out on this conference. It's very important right now. Jamie, you and I, over the course of the last 12 months, and folks, it's always interesting with Jamie, because Jamie and I don't plan anything in advance. Uh, Dave Hodges is, is our guest Thursday night, and Dave's already planning all this stuff out, what he's going to talk about, and what he's telling me what I should ask questions about. Jamie and I don't do that. We just roll with it. But Jamie, we've talked about a lot of different stuff over the course of the last 12 months, all the way up through when I had to have my surgery, you know, and then I think I've interviewed you once since then. Uh, and you were a prime example of what the body of Christ means to me, because as soon as you heard that I had triple bypass surgery, man, you were talking to me. You were telling me you would you would get in your car and you would come up here and help out and make sure our house was taken care of. That, to me, is what the true spirit of the body of Christ is. We talk a lot about what's wrong with the church. That's what's right with the church, you know. And And I think, you know, as we look at tonight, we want to take a look, I think, at uh, in these times that we are in right now, uh, with all the craziness that's that's going on, the, all the rumors and the, all that stuff, all the stuff that doesn't matter. Believe me, you guys, it doesn't matter. Try almost dying. You'll understand a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. But... Uh, you know, Jimmy, what do you think's going on? What do you think that we really need to be paying attention to as brothers and sisters in Christ? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a loaded question, but, you know, the simplicity of it is, and then we can build a foundation and work off of that is, is to get fixated on the Lord. I mean, it, it's interesting, even in groups like this, you know, and this isn't a castigation or condemnation on anybody. It's the nature of our culture and humanity. And we don't even understand the uh, multidimensional cosmic assault that our brains are under 24 seven and our minds and therefore our hearts and what comes out of our hearts. But we uh, even in gatherings like this, the majority of us are so far removed from the Lord so far. And, uh, and yeah. it's even in, in our own little, you know, church body here. And, you know, it's just a fearsome thing to handle the word of the Lord and, and, you know, um, seek by God's grace to bring my all week after week after week. And even within that, I, you know, it's, it's probably 50% could care less. 
uh, scrolling through Facebook and stuff like that uh, while I'm pe preaching. And it's only like 50 people, right? Like it's a small group. And so, so it's highly distraction, but it's, it's endemic or indicative, I guess is the better word of the spirit of the age that I speak about all the time and how the Lord is going to distinguish those who serve him from those who do not. He absolutely is. And the distinguishing factor, as we've talked about on here multiple times, is the fear of the Lord. That's Malachi 3.16 through 4.3. You know, then those who feared the Lord were found talking with one another, and the Lord heard, and the Lord listened, and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared him and who revered his name. And he says, they will make up my treasured possession, and I will distinguish them just as a father distinguished me between a son who serves him and a son who does not. And so like there is actually very definitive distinguishing factors that the Lord lays out for his body all throughout scriptures. I mean, just this Sunday, I was preaching on, uh, on the, the reality of your willingness or lack thereof to confess or profess the Lord before men. And, and like, I don't know why most believers, modern, you know, Laodicean age believers don't even understand the context of this stuff. When Jesus says, if you acknowledge me. If you confess me before men, I'll confess your name before the father. And everybody's like, yay, yay. What? And it, oh, but they, they don't ever want to finish the verse. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the father. Right. And when we look at even the singularity of the entire end times, uh, paradigm, the entirety of the end times paradigm, it's all about a public profession and proclamation period one to the powers of darkness to the antichrist to the b system for unto self-preservation because of fear of familial rejection and persecution cultural rejection and persecution and number one always the singular attribute is economic persecution it's uh, and you have to make a public profession versus those who he sees uh you know before the throne room of god worship him day and night and they're going to rule and reign with christ for a thousand years and they're they're going to take part in the first resurrection he says blessed and holy are they because they professed jesus christ and they were beheaded for their testimony right and it even rolls into revelation 12 11 that they overcame him right all this stuff of the end times uh, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as they're afraid to lose it. I think it's in Romans 10. It says, how will people know unless they are, they're told and how will they be told unless you speak and how will you speak unless you're willing to preach to them? And like, it's all on us. And yet we as a church have totally blown it. And so when I say, you know, we have to do business with the Holy God who loves us and forsake everything, father, mother, brother, sister, even your very life. He says, if you do not forsake those things, you cannot be my disciples. The scriptures are so definitive and declarative over and over. Every statement is so declarative. There's no gray area. I say this all the time. There's no gray area in the kingdom of heaven, right? There's only one color of glory. There's no gray area. And you know, people that want to walk the fence, two things. For one thing, the devil owns the fence. And secondly, more in particular to guys, when you walk a fence, and you end up slipping and falling, you're going to rack something incredibly hard. And you will know that you should not have been rocking that fence, walking that fence. Everybody knows what I'm inferring there, right? And so this is the reality of how um, there, there is such a disconnect right now, which is the, which is the spirit of the age, where the majority of people, even, even maybe some of you gather in the Zoom meeting where you're saying, I don't... I, yeah, that doesn't relate to me. That has no bearing on me. Why? Because I'm wealthy and in need of nothing. And see, what we don't understand is like that it is the spirit of the age. It's not the spirit of those guys. And as soon as you relegate it to the spirit of those guys, you're already, uh, that should be a high indicator that you're probably not where you thought you were, be, where, where you should be spiritually. If you think that that is only relevant to those guys over there or those guys over there. And actually the Christian truth or movement is probably the most far from God out of any other believers I've ever met. I know believers in Catholic churches, they're Catholics 
and they have a fear of the Lord and authentic desire to want to honor and glorify the Lord more than any Christian truth I've ever met. I know people that are in those NAR churches, and although they may not understand all the different deceptions that are going on, they have an authentic hunger and thirst for righteousness and for more Jesus Christ, and they walk in humility and contrition. What has been required of you all men, but that you walk humbly, you know, act justly and and um, and walk humbly with your God. I totally butchered that. But it and it goes on and on and on and and like all these fears. And so actually the Christian truth or movement who thinks they are awake, who thinks they are above or beyond. Beyond that spirit of the age is a pretty high indicator that they actually are a victim of the spirit of the age because they say that they're wealthy and in need of nothing, right? And actually they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, insert uh, your guys' conference coming up, right? I, I know because... I host things too by God's leading, not by choice. There's no monetary gain in it. Mike and Jeannie are very well aware of that. There's no benefit to hosting an event to gather believers. It is nonstop drama and trauma and finances outpouring. You lose tons of money, but you do it because the Lord calls you to do it and you do it by obedience. But you will see, like mark my words, at the conference we hold here, I know at your guys's is the Christian, the truth of Christians, right? That's kind of our sphere of influence. They demand that their flesh, their every waking carnal desire is met every second of the day. And they make, they have no fear of doing it. They have no fear of imposing themselves on people, getting as much as they can, taking whatever they can, fire hosing you with all their wound, all their, all their traumas. Like they, they're, they, they're time thieves. They're, they're resource thieves. They're emotional thieves. They're parasitic in every way because it's always about them. It's always about them. It's never about the Lord and it's never about the Lord's people. And it's never about the Lord's glory. It's about them. And so, <clears throat> That's even like to your point, Mike, about being the body to the body. I mean, that's our mono my whole moniker with Omega Dynamics. For one thing is strengthening and equipping a warrior class of Christians for the days ahead. And the other thing is being the body to the body. And those two are intrinsically linked. We talk about it all the time on here. What is a warrior? A warrior is has a mutually assured degree of selfless sacrifice. That was what makes a warrior. For me, Mike, to come see you, brother. That's not sacrificial, dude. That's like to honor you. You're my brother. Why, how could I not do that? Like I, I have a compulsion to honor you as my brother. There is no cost involved. What? So what? You lose five days of work. So what? You lose a couple thousand dollars. So what? You lose a, who cares? When you have a brother or sister who's in dire straits and desperate need and just needs companionship or to know that they're loved or even to have tangible things taken care of for them, like plowing Mike and Jeannie's driveway or whatever, then you do it because that's what warriors do. You selflessly sacrifice 24-7 towards the object of your love. Corey Ten Boom actually coined this coined this phrase. I believe it was Corey Ten Boone, right? <laughs> I always say, don't quote me on that. My brain's so mixed up with stuff all the time. But she said, um, love, authentic love. I always give that qualifier. You guys know I'm always about qualifiers. Authentic love, not what you think love is and not what culture has told you love is and not what your emotions are informing you what love is. I'm talking about real love, authentic love. And she said, authentic love will always manifest itself to the degree to which it is willing to sacrifice towards the object of its love. Did everybody catch that? Or you want me to say it again? Authentic love will always manifest itself to the degree to which it is willing to sacrifice towards the object of its love, i.e. Christ Jesus. No greater love is there than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you obey my commands, right? Like that is the highest form of authentic love. And so, you know, there I'm I'm growing increasing. Fearful is the wrong word, but I'll just use it. You guys know me and my posture and, and stuff like that, but I'll just use the word fearful. I'm becoming increasingly fearful or aware of how few are going to be left standing when things, when there's actually a little bit of pressure applied, very few, so very few. Why? Because they love pleasure rather than God. They are lovers of self. 
proud, boastful, arrogant, treacherous, rash, abusive, full of conceit. I mean, you name it, always learning, never able to come in and understand the truth. They won't tolerate sound doctrine, right? They allow the way of truth to come in and disrepute. And all the while they say they're wealthy and they need nothing because they're a superstar, whatever, because they've watched every podcast. Oh, and they force themselves to speak in tongues, which isn't even authentic anyways. They literally make it up. Are they read King James? Are they whatever? I mean, pick a thing that people want to self-exalt on. They self-exalt on because it's always about them. It's never about the glory of the Holy One of Israel. See, and until people understand that, they can never be undone by the gospel. Well, yeah, you can yeah, never yeah. be undone by the gospel until you realize it has nothing to do with you. It's Jesus said, so that they will see me and glorify my Father in heaven. And the Father says, so that they will see my Son and glorify Him and magnify Him. And so they're both pointing at each other. It's all about us being glorified. And then we go, no, it's about me being glorified. What about my woundings? What about my emotions? What about my finances? What about my whatever? I need to be heard. I need this. I need, I need, I need. I like, I'm always thinking of Veruca from Willy Wonka, right? Like all the time. That's what's always on my mind is like, I want the world. I want the whole world. Like Veruca Salt, like insane, right? And it's like, I want the world, daddy, and I want it now. And that's actually the posture with which 80% of the counseling that when people call for counseling, that's what it is, you know? And there's times where in love, I'd had his, I've, I've had to say before, this may sound harsh, but it's in loving and it snaps people out of things. I'm like, dude, our sister, stop talking. I am so sick of listening to you talk about yourself. You have not said anything about the Lord. You've not said anything of value. It is all about you. And you are not taking any more of my time. We're done. We're done. You're parasitic. And I got to imagine you've been doing that your entire life. You've made this whole world all about you. And I, and I can tell by your language that everybody, you know, is alienated from you and you're alone and you're isolated and you want to blame it on the devil or you want to blame it on your mom or your dad or your siblings or your whatever. No freaking way, dude, that's on you. And you're not taking any more of my time so that you can feed your flesh. That's not what I'm here for. So this is the reality of where we're at. And what we're going to see is as these pressures begin to mount, right? Even with, uh, with your guys' conference coming up in Dallas with the uh, prophetic signs in the heavenlies as the, as the axiom, right? Or the underpinnings of why we're gathering. Uh, most people have no clue what's coming. I mean, I talk about it ad nauseum. There's all kinds of great uh, uh, teachers or preachers or whoever out there talking about it and, and, uh, researchers and investigators and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. And unfortunately, the majority of the professing Christians, m many, most who will gather here, you know, at our base camp, many, most who will gather, you know, in Dallas or whatever, they're, they're not gonna, they're not gonna make the cut. And I'm not saying, that's not Jamie saying that. That's not my perspective. That's just straight biblical. That's what the Lord lays out. They're not going to make the cut because there's so much double-mindedness and passive manipulation of the spirit of God mixed in with why they're doing what they're doing. Even with showing up to different things or being a part of different groups or being, a, there's always a degree of self that they are taking. They're stealing, killing, and destroying from the glory of God. And the powers of darkness does it through them while they're unwitting. They're, they're unw Some of them are wittingly doing it. Some of them are unwittingly doing it. But they allow the glory of God to be stolen through them because they actually make it about them, not about the Lord. And, and that's the thing is like until we realize that it's not about us, uh, then, then we're we're literally um, paddling upstream to nowhere. And, and so... Um, one of the things that we need to be focusing on more and more as a body is individual individualism, for lack of a better word, individually, intentionally, painstakingly seeking the face of the Lord and allowing him to make you undone, allowing him to crush you and to reduce you and to mortify your flesh and crucify your flesh. Allow him to expose your fears and your anxieties and your selfishness, your self-absorption. Allow it all to be exposed 
because it is the loving kindness and mercy of the Lord to expose you now willingly rather than later on desperately. Allow it all to be exposed. So then when you come forward into a body or into a gathering or into prayer or into whatever, or even seeking the Lord's face, seeking wisdom of the Holy Spirit for your next steps or whatever, that you are coming in purity. It's all about a pure heart and a pure heart. The Lord won't refuse. But unfortunately, most people have a highly impure heart. Look at all the letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. They were convinced. These are churches, church ages and literal churches and literal church ages. And then all of them are signified in the last church age. There's a couple different prophetic overlays going on throughout Revelation 2, 2 and 3. That they are all actively in active uh, service to the Lord. His name is on their lips. And yet every single one of them, he has he is offended by them. And he has an admonishment for them because of the impurity of their conduct. They made it always about them. He said they followed Jezebel. They tolerate that Jezebel. And the Nicolaitans, you guys do that. You've gone the way of Balaam. You do that. You say this, but you say that. You say you're a lot, but I tell you what, you're you're dead and wake up. Strengthen what little remains is and about to die. Like, and if you don't, I myself am going to come and make war against you. That's what Jesus is saying against his church. If you don't, I myself will come and make war against you. Oh, we're special. We're highly favored. We're whatever. Really? So is Israel. And God said, I have removed my compassion, my pity, and my love from you. He says, I have a writ of divorce for you. And he goes, never again. I will disinherit you. I thought we were highly favored. I thought we were covenant. I thought we were whatever. Well, you are covenanted. However, there it's there's... It's highly conditional, and people don't like that reality about the gospel, but it is highly conditional. No greater love is there than this. We already said it, that a man would lay down his life for his friends, and you are my friends if. See, that's a condition. You are my friends if, if you obey my commands. Like, there's all these if-thens, if-thens. Anybody who says he loves me but did not, not obey my commands. By the way, that is not Torah observance. I'll say that straight up. That has nothing to do with Torah observance. That is such an anathema, such an anathema to make that about some Torah observant things that's sweeping the world in this firestorm right now. By the way, all of that is preparing the way for the Antichrist. All the Torah observance stuff, all this taking back on the yoke of slavery, all this repudiation of the blood of Christ, the trampling underfoot the grace of Christ, the, the pro public proclamation that the sufficiency of Christ is not sufficient, but you will be so easily bewitched after having begun with the spirit. Now you want to begin with the flesh and you think that you'll have a right scene with God because of the feast days and because you set up an RV in your backyard for five days out of the year. I'm telling you, you, this thing, the Lord is about ready to sift the masses from every angle imaginable to expose the hearts of men. And if we allow it, it's under humility and contrition and brokenness and therefore meekness. And once you get exposed and get brought down to that level, he goes, now watch my grace because he gives grace to the humble. But when we double down and we double down and we double down and we make excuses, we make self-justifications, we want a righteousness of our own by what we do and what we say and how we do and what we do by our Bible translations and by our whatever, and then by our observances and then by our days and our Sabbath keeping this. And blah, blah. He's like, go ahead, go have a righteousness of your own. And then when you stand before me, I'll let you know how that works out for you. Go ahead and get a righteousness of your own. But anything apart from a righteousness of Christ, I'm telling you, is going to fail you beyond comprehension. It is never going to suffice at all. And that's why the church right now must do business with the holy God who loves them and allow all this stuff, all the dross to be scraped off so that you can be pure and blameless on the day of the Lord. And you know how you're pure and blameless on the day of the Lord? Do you guys know? You have zero justification of your own, and you have zero righteousness of your own. You do not say, Lord, Lord, I did these things for you. He'll say, away from me, 
not just away from me, I never knew you. See, you're unknown by him. He says, away from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. So when I'm using language like it's antagonistic or it's abominable to the Lord to do these particular things, I'm using his language because that's what he says. You are actually your works. You are working iniquity because you're trampling underfoot the sufficiency of my son. And you want a righteousness of your own. You want a justification of your own. You want a puffed upness of your own. And I am in opposition to the proud. But to the grace, I show humility. He says, this is the man who I esteem, him who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. Not him who goes, oh, you don't eat kosher? I eat kosher. You don't. I mean, like insane, right? <laughs> like you're an instant opposition to a holy God because you've made it all about you. You are a lover of self. It's about what you do and what you don't do and what you touch and what you don't touch and what you partake in and what you abstain from so that you can self-validate on the sliding scale and then lord it over the next guy. And the Lord's like, you have no clue what my gospel was about. You have no clue. And you know who else did that? The Pharisees. They used the name of God in every detail, every waking detail of their life was to honor God. And yet he says, you're of your father, the devil. You are a brood of vipers. And actually John the Baptist was so offended that they even came to hear the truth. He said, who told you were to come here? The words of life, who told you were to come here? It ain't for you. You made your choice a long time ago. You made sure that it was all about you. You know, and I was just reading this in John 12, I think it's John 12, I don't know, 32 or 42 or something like that. It says, and many among the leaders, many in the community, many among the elders believed in Jesus Christ, but for fear of putting out of the synagogue, being put out of the synagogue, they would not acknowledge him before men. And it says, because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I mean, that's how detailed these scriptures are all the time. And so... Uh, there, there are prophetic signs coming in the heavenlies, beloved, like one after another, after another marching out, which the Lord told us they would signs in the sun, moon, and the stars, men foreboding after these things, looking up to these things coming into the skies. They are coming and marching out systematically pretty much from here on out. Uh, I mean, you guys are aware that obviously the eclipse coming on the 8th and the devil's comet. I'm sure you're aware of that. It's visible in the sky right now uh, over where I'm at. I can I can look up with the naked eye and see it. It's in the uh, Andromeda uh, complex up in the up in the heavenlies. Apophis 2025 and in 2029, several other different astral catastrophism based bodies. Uh, the moon is literally, and, and I do, when I read this article the other day, I was like, no way that like, I just thought it was like a lunar eclipse when it says the moon will turn blood, blood red. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. All the scientific community and the astronomical community are freaking out because the moon, the, the poles on the moon are actually turning rust, blood red, which now is changing, throwing off all their paradigms because they didn't know that iron could exist. Like it couldn't oxidize unless there was some sort of atmospheric conditions for it to oxidize. The moon is literally turning red, actually physically turning red right now. Nobody's paying attention to it. You know, the, we have these different astronomical things going on within the sun and these CMEs, coronal mass ejections and, and, uh, and the uh, perturbances that are occurring on the, on the face of the earth. And with the magnetosphere, which is secondary, secondary to these celestial perturbances that are altering and shifting our, our, our crustal plates and our, our hyper volcanism, right. And even the migratory patterns of the birds and everybody keeps going, no, it's the government. It's the government. It's the government. It's like, well, yes, but don't let them confuse you to make you think it's always about what they're doing instead of God literally getting the attention of all of humanity. By the way, that's the entire faint psyop of the green movement and of all this. I don't even think I can say you can't say the word that has to do with our meteorological reality around us because you'll literally get banned from YouTube because it is one of the number one tools of their asymmetric warfare so that you won't acknowledge God's judgment coming on the earth. It's man-made. 
It's because of man. It's because of man. That's why. That's why the heat, and that's why the drought, and that's why the pestilence, blah, 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 and that's why we got to depopulate, and that's why, blah, blah, blah. and like, that's why the super storms, and that's why this, and it's like, really? Well, my God said his way is in the world, we're in the storm. I don't care what they have with all their harp and all the other things. That's my God's tool of justice and judgment. That is how my God operates. And all they're trying to do is mimic it so that your faint maneuver pulls your eyes over there. And even we as believers won't acknowledge the lateness of the hour. As Christ said to the disciples, like, dude, you do well. Like, you can see that the sky is doing this and you know what's happening. You can see, you know what's going on. Like, why can't you discern the times? Why can't you discern the times? And if we did discern the times, would we really be playing these churchianity games, like self-deceiving ourselves? Like, I think the number one self-deception that I hear is, I'm not that bad. Number one so, what do you mean you're not that bad? Like, you waking up today in your sin, apart from Christ, is so bad that the king of glory had to die to rectify it, to reconcile it, and to eventually restore it. What do you mean you're not that bad? You're every way. It says your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can understand it? And the fact that you would look at yourself and go, I'm not that bad, shows you just how carnal you actually are. Like that, that should be reproof of that you are that bad. And the reality is, until you can acknowledge how deeply desperate you are in your flesh, how depraved you are in your thoughts and your intents and your motives, even on your best days, as the scriptures say, all your acts of righteousness are like menstrual cloths. That's what the word says. All your acts of righteousness are like a used maxi pad before the Holy Lord. And you go, no, I'm not that bad. And it's like, no wonder why we're not undone by the gospel. Cause you know how you get undone by the gospel. You understand exactly what you are. And you understand exactly who he is. And in between that huge chasm between who you are and who God, the righteous, just, judge, holy, in all of his ways, that chasm between you, Christ Jesus fills it all. And then you're actually undone by the gospel. And then you actually are humble because you know you bring nothing to the table. You bring absolutely nothing to the table other than your sin. You don't have anything to offer him but your sin. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. Like, take my yoke upon you. Here, let's do this cosmic exchange. You give me your sin, and I will imbue to you my righteousness. How's that for a cosmic exchange? You have nothing to offer him. Absolutely nothing to offer him other than a humble and contrite heart that goes, God, I know exactly what I am. I'm not walking in shame, though. I'm not walking in condemnation. I'm very well aware of who I am. I'm very well aware of who you are. And I praise you and I worship you. And God, take my whole life. See, this is where the return on investment comes, right? 30, 60, 100 fold. This is where a servant is reproved when the master is a long time coming. What he did with the talents entrusted to him. What is your return on investment of the righteousness of Christ imbued to you? Put on you the righteousness and the holy, no, holiness of Christ, knowing exactly what you are and exactly. And you go, oh, my God, I'm undone. And you go, God, take my whole life. What would you have me do, Lord? And he says nothing. Love your children. Love your husband, who's difficult to love. Love your wife, who's difficult to love. That's what I require of you, that you would be humble and contrite and that you would so trust me that you have no fear because my perfect love cast out all fear. And when you fear, it shows that you don't understand my love. It actually shows that you don't believe that I am who I say I am. When you fear, it shows that you don't think I'm sufficient. You don't think I'm good. You don't think I'm wise. You don't think I'm perfect in all my ways. You actually don't think I am who I say I am because you fear. He goes, be perfected by my love because it'll cast out all fear, right? And he goes down each and every nuance of our emotions and of our character flaws and of our personalities and of our double-mindedness and of the war from without and the war from within. And he's speaking life and speaking life and speaking life and speaking life. And he says, I know what you are, as it says in Psalm, blah, can't remember. He says, I remember what you are. I know that you are just dust. How high of expectations does he have for you? 
He says to uh, Jacob, I, I think Isaiah 41, he says, oh, little Israel, oh, Jacob, you worm. I love you. That's what he's saying. Like, you are a weak, wriggling worm. I can't tell your head from your butt. You do nothing but eat dirt. You're a pitageless, and I love you. I know exactly what you are, and you are the object of my love. So when we go, no, I'm not that bad. I'm pretty good. And it's like, dude, what, what can the Lord do with that? What can he do with that posture? Well, I read my Bible and I do this and I'm pretty pious. And I, oh, and I do, I, I uh, don't eat pork. And it's like, wow, that's what you've reduced it to, huh? What you eat or what you don't eat. What day you do this on what day you do that. How you say this or how you do it, what you watch or what you don't watch. I mean, it's like, oh my goodness, this is insane. But again, it's the spirit of the age. And we are lovers of self and we don't even know. Always learning, always learning, 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 learning. And you know what the enemy loves about God's people always learning is he can lead them to learn anything he wants that's going to distract them from the truth because Jesus is the truth, period. If you're learning anything other than the face of Jesus, it's a waste of time. It really is a waste of time. At the end of the day, I don't care if you don't know anything about eschatology. I don't care if you don't know anything about Greek and Hebrew and blah, blah, blah. I don't care if you don't know anything, but you are undone because you know that you were blind and now you can see. And that's all you can give testimony to. And you're so undone by that. God goes, watch what I'll do with that. He goes, look at that widow putting the two mites in. Watch what I do with her. Look at that widow and watch, watch what I do. They don't know anything. They're uneducated, unlearned men, and people were astonished and took note for one singularity. What was it? That they had been with Jesus. Uneducated, unlearned men, and they astonished the world and took note that they had been with Jesus. See, the enemy takes note when you've been with Jesus. That's why he wants you to make it all about all these other things other than the Lord. The enemy knows those who have been with Jesus, and the Father absolutely knows those who have been with Jesus. And that's why he says, at that time, those who feared the Lord were found talking with one another, and the Lord heard and the Lord listened. And a scroll was written in his presence concerning those who feared him and revered him. He goes, set them apart because they're humble, and they will be the object of my grace. Watch what I'll do. But all the other excuses... All the woe is me, all the victim, oh, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. That's pride. All the insecurity, oh, but uh, just this, and if I was only this, I'm a, that's pride. All the, I'm just so fearful, I'm so anxious. That's pride. It's all about you. Like any single thing that you can possibly parse out in your reality, you will realize the root of it is pride. Wherever there's selfish ambition or envy, there you have disorder in every evil practice right? Like what causes quarreling and fighting among you? You want, but you don't receive. You don't receive because you don't ask. And then when you do ask, it's impure so that you can spin it on yourself. You know, oh, a double-minded man ought not think he should receive anything from the Lord. And he goes on and on and on and on about people that are actually willing to be undone by the sufficiency of Christ. Noticed, notice what the entire end times narrative is centered on is a rejection and a repudiation of the sufficiency of Christ by the Christians, by the Christians. And it is, this is my presupposition, my speculation. And I've been saying this for 15 years that the abomination of desolation will be the re-implementation of animal sacrifice for the remission of your sins. Mark my words. It is not some weird hyper- cosmological crazy thing it will be the fact that those five red heifers that they took from texas over to israel and they built the altar and the ramp up to the altar on the it's currently built right now and the heifers are of age that's a particular word to be a heifer that they're going to march them up and they're going to slaughter these red heifers and 90 percent of christians evangelical christians are going to cheer for it because they think it has something to do with god 
has nothing to do with God, has everything to do with the powers of darkness, mocking and assaulting the sufficiency of the blood of Christ. That's what all this Hebraic roots, all this Torah observant, all this Nard dominionism, all this preterism, all this amillennialism, all this political Zionism, it's all taking us to the same place. It is a mockery of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ alone. And they will be like, yes, the temple. Yes, this is a restoration of the Torah. Yes, this is a return of righteousness of the law. And it's like, dude, have you never read your Bible? Seriously, have you never read any of the New Testament? Have you ever read the red letter words of Christ? There could be nothing more offensive than to take back on those things after what Christ has done for us and even imparted to us with his spirit. Nothing more offensive. And so that's why it's so critical right now to get centered on Christ alone, on Christ alone. Mike? You know, if I didn't tell you, I was absolutely stunned. I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone would, would understand. I mean, you blew me away tonight. I happen to be, Jamie, that uneducated man that you talk about. I don't. You know, I don't know. People talk to me about the Nephilim mounds and all that stuff. I don't know about any of that. You know, all I know is about Jesus. And I know what Jesus can do. I know what I was a putrid, awful, horrible, wretched sinner, uh, a homeless person, someone who'd been in jail. And Jesus picked me to save me because Amen. that's what he does. You know, and and we talked earlier about, you know, uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ and what happened, you know, there was no, I guarantee you, I know this for a fact. When Jamie found out what happened to me, there was never in his mind, a question about whether he would help me or not. There was never a question in my mind when Jamie had some things happen in the past few years where he needed help. You can ask Jeannie, I just call and say, well, this is what I'm doing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I don't know how I'm going to keep everything else going. You just do it because that's what Jesus does. And Jamie, I mean, do you think that as, as the church, for lack of a better term, do you think we get too hung up on all this external knowledge about everything else that we don't focus on just what it is Jesus would want us to do? Yeah, to a degree. I mean, there's nothing wrong with study, you know, study to show yourself a workman approved one who rightly divides the word of truth, right? That we're called to, uh, to, uh, I pray that your love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you can rightly discern, right? So we have a lot of verses that are talking about the value of knowledge, the value of study. And like, you know, knowledge begets understanding, understanding when applied over a long period of time begets wisdom, but all that knowledge and then understanding under wisdom, if it's not rooted in the fear of the Lord, it's all vain. And that's what Solomon came to understanding of at the end of his life. That's why I said with much knowledge comes much sorrow, right? Like he, he was like, it was empty. It was vain. Read Ecclesiastes. He had it all. And he's like, it's, it's all worthless. It's chasing after the wind. And then, and then I tried this and like, that's worthless. And then I tried this and that's what, and I tried that. And he's like, and at the end of his life, it's like the only conclusion was, to be humble and be in the presence of God. That's the only thing that has value, you know? And so what we have uniquely is actually even prophetic fulfillment of the book of Daniel with regards to the generation of the time of the end, when knowledge would greatly increase and people would be running to and fro, right? And all this stuff. And then we have the spirit of the age prophetic fulfillments about they'll always be learning, but never able to come into understanding the truth. They will devote themselves, devote, powerful word, do a word study in the word devotion and what it means to devote it. They will devote themselves to the doctrines of demons and the way of truth, which is Christ himself will come into disrepute. It has nothing to, it's about what you eat and don't eat. It's about Saturday versus Sunday, Saturn day versus Sunday. Oh, I know because I mean, dude, it is insane. It's about the shape of the earth. Pick a thing, but what it's never about is your standing before a holy God in Christ. See, when I think about the, the, the most, one of the most majestic verses in all the scripture 
I think of Jude all the time. I think of Jude all the time. I quote Jude all the time. Now to him who is able to present you and to make you stand in his presence, blameless and with great joy to the only God, our father, be all power, authority, and dominion, both now and forevermore. Amen. To him who is able to make you stand, not cower, not groveling at his feet, not like, oh, phew, I can't believe I got in here, not smelling like a bonfire, like the apostle Paul says, Christ is the foundation which every man builds. Some build with stick, hay, st st stick, hay, and straw, others with gold, silver, and precious stones. At the coming of the Son of Man, each person's material will be tested with fire to see what's left standing. And though he may suffer loss, he will be saved, and he will enter a the kingdom of heaven, but some as it renders in some translations by the skin of their teeth. Like, so think of how thick the skin is on your teeth. That's how you barely, I don't want to come into the kingdom of heaven smelling like a bonfire. I'd rather be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who it says that not a hair on their head was singed, that or they were not burned, their clothes were not singed, not a hair on their heads was singed, nor was the smell of smoke found on them. Such fullness fullness of covering and who was with them in the furnace jesus jesus was with them in the furnace now to him who is able to make you stand in his presence he's gonna you're gonna stand blameless and with great joy like think of those things like why would you want any righteousness apart from jesus how could you, how narcissistic must you be to want any other covering other than Jesus, any other righteousness apart from Jesus, any other justification apart from Jesus, any other holiness apart from Christ's holiness? How could you want anything else other than Christ Jesus? Lord, Lord, I did all these things on my own for your name. And he says, what he say to the Israelites in Amos? He says it in Zephaniah. He says in Hosea, I hate your sacrifices. I hate them. He goes, I never wanted that from you. You think the fat of rams is pleasing to me? A broken and contrite heart. That's what I'll never refuse. And as David said, Lord, if you wanted sacrifice, I would have brought you tons of them. But I know, I know my God. It had nothing to do with the law. It had nothing to do with the sacrifices. It had nothing to do with the religious, religiosity of what I did. He goes, it, obedience that's better than sacrifice to you. God says, I hate your offerings. I hate your sacrifices. I hate your fellowship gatherings away from me with the sound of your worship music. I never wanted that. I've always wanted your heart. I want your heart. But you think you have something very special to bring me. And now I'm in opposition to you. And usually it's because we love the world and the things of the world, which is the validation of men. We love ourselves. We're of the world. We love stuff. We love comfort. We love validation. We love puffed up in this. We love people to listen to our drama stories over and over and over again, instead of walking in the freedom of Christ. We love ourselves. And he says, anybody who loves the world of the things of the world, the love of the Father, I'm telling you, the love of the Father is not in them. I'm not saying this. That's what the scriptures say. And I'm held accountable just like everybody else will be held accountable. And you know what I'm very well aware of as I say that is there's no way I could ever meet that mark. Never. But Christ Jesus did in my stead. And so I'll magnify him all the more. I could never meet that mark but my king did. It says his faithfulness is your shield and buckler. Why? Because you'll never be. 